Hey, we're, today we're beginning a new series uh, on the First Corinthians. First Corinthians is uh, an amazing book of the Bible that deals with, people often say, can't we just go back to the early church? Oh, let me tell you, we romanticize often the past, don't we? First Corinthians, Corinth was a really rough area of the world. And so if you think we got trouble right now trying to have unity, hey guys, have you guys noticed it's kind of hard to have unity right now? Yeah. Have you noticed how the church is unified? Yeah, right? Yeah, we, we struggle with unity, don't we? And sometimes what happens as a result of that, we're like, why is it we believe in Jesus, we believe that he rose again from the dead, we believe in all this, but why are we dividing over politics, culture, and everything else? How do we stand unified? You see, there's tremendous power in unity. The Bible says in Psalm 133.1, for there the Lord commanded the blessing. How many of you want God to command blessing in your life? Wouldn't you like that? Command blessing at work? Command blessing in your relationships? Command blessing with your finances? Wouldn't you like that? I know I would. Well, how does that happen? How can we have God command blessings in our lives? How do we get to the point where we can do more? You see, a lot of times the problem is we live our lives alone, and God doesn't want us to live our lives alone because your heart will turn to stone. What you need and what we need is each other. God has created us for him and for his body, and there's great power in that. So for God commands a blessing. Now, how does he command a blessing? I'm so glad you asked. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren, that includes ladies as well, to dwell together in what? Unity. Unity. Behold how good and how pleasant it is when brethren, women and men, dwell together. What does dwell mean? Dwell means that you're living together. It doesn't mean that you're by yourself. It doesn't mean, no, it means you're in community. Dwell together in unity. It is there that God commands a blessing. And the enemy knows that. He knows that when we dwell together in unity, there's power. And so the enemy does anything he can to bring division between sons and daughters, parents and their children, between husbands and wives, between people in the church. He'll do anything in his, in his power to bring division because he understands the great power there is in unity. There's power in unity to begin with. But when you put the Holy Spirit in the middle of it, there's nothing we cannot do together in unity. Do you realize there was a group of 120 people that were locked away in a prayer room and Jesus went away? He was in heaven at this point and they're by themselves. They have a bunch of people that are coming after him that are Jewish. They're Jewish as well, but they believe in the Messiah. And Jesus says, wait until the power comes. They're in a room of 120 of them. And there they are together, 120 and the Holy Spirit fell upon them while they were in unity. And nothing has been able to quell or stop the church of Jesus Christ. Not Rome, not Hitler, not in the mausoleum, not a mausoleum. Not, not even a mausoleum because we raised from the dead. I intended to say that. See, I'm so smart that I even joke. Okay. But God works with us in unity. There's power in unity, and we have to understand the power in unity. Now, how do we get unity? How do we do it? We see all the difficulty. We're going to be looking at a church in Corinth, which was an amazing church. The apostle Paul was helped, founded it. He's an apostle, which means he was sent out, and he went to Corinth, this area, modern-day Turkey, and he spread the gospel, and churches were founded in this area. He was there for about a year and a half. He goes away and he hears these, ama these stories how things are going really poorly. So, I mean, we think we got it bad in our culture. It was bad. In fact, I don't know if you've ever heard whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. No, whatever happens in Vegas, they have a recording of it. Look out. And so whatever you do, so Corinth was kind of that place. It was a place, a metropolitan place. It was a place, a seaport town. It was a lot of things going on there, and the church was there. They had, they had temples of prostitutes. It was very common for people to go to visit the prostitutes. In fact, I'm just telling you what it was like, okay? You may not like it, but this is what was, you think it's bad here. It was a lot worse there. People would go to prostitutes for about the price of a glass of wine. And this is what was going on in that day. People would come to church, and they would go to church and visit the prostitute. 
They'd be in church. They'd be fighting with each other. Meanwhile, in the church, they had spiritual gifts. They had signs and wonders taking place. And sometimes we as the church, we want to see the full aspect of God's power in the church. I am for that completely. But Jesus says, many will say in that day, Lord, we prophesied in your name. Lord, we cast out demons in your name. And I will say to them, I never knew you. So we often look to the gifts of the Holy Spirit instead of God himself. So here's a church that was riddled in chaos. Uh, people were sleeping with their mother-in-laws. I mean, it was bad. It was a Jerry Springer show. If you don't know who Jerry Springer is, don't look him up. Stay focused. Right, right here, okay? It was bad. And so it was crazy. Now, today, it's amazing, right? We're in the church today. Do you know there's over 45 to 47,000 different denomination in Christendom alone? Right? If I don't like this church, we have the first fundamentalist um, Pentecostal Baptist Episcopalian Church of Greater New Hartford. What? <laughs> I mean, we, right? if I don't like what you're doing, I'll pick up my marbles and go someplace else. It is all these, well, who's the right one? What's going on? How do we live together? You see, the enemy would want to pull us apart. How do you and I find unity and power? You see, I, I am convinced that if you and I will be united to Christ, and you and I will work together in our local communities. Watch what God can do. I just spoke to someone this past week, and they shared with me how their life has been transformed by them being involved with a small group. That situations that were overcoming them, they have found power as a result of other people praying with them. One could chase 1,000 to 10,000. That we're not designed to do this alone. We're not supposed to be codependent. We're codependent to be dependent on Jesus. And this is what they did. Now, how are you supposed to get along? The people think all different things. And if you don't agree with me, then you're a horrible person, right? This is how it happens. How do we find great power? There's great power in unity. God commands his blessing. Well, how are we supposed to do that? Let me just share with you the power we have in the Holy Spirit. And also, I don't know if you recognize this fact, but in the book of Genesis, in chapter 11, the earth was bankrupt with morality. That's why it's chapter 11, by the way. Okay. But what happened was all of mankind, let me read it to you. And the Lord said, Behold, they're one people, they have one language, and this only is the beginning of what they'll be able to do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible. Why? They're in unity. Whether you're a believer or not, the law of unity, the law of synergy works. When you get me, if you ever play tennis and someone's better than you and you can become better, how about these dream teams, right? You have these incredible athletes that get all these athletes together for a basketball team. And they, even though the roster is amazing, they don't play together as a team and they don't win. You get an average team that works together as a team that can be extraordinary. We, we've talked about that if a horse can pull 8,000 pounds, do you think two horses would be uh, 16,000? No, it's actually more than that. It's about 24,000 pounds. That's 50% more because they're together in unity. And see, there's power in unity. And the enemy understands that. And so what happened in the book of Genesis is they all got together. They had one language. They had one purpose. And they were building this tower to become like God. Not relying on God, become like God. And they had one language and one purpose Look what happened. My friends, do you realize that we're coming back to the time of Tower of Babel right now in our century, this new century? That it's very possible that we're going to have a one world government. And how's that going to happen? I'm not going to get into that right now, but there's extraordinary things happen. Do you realize the languages that used to divide us are going away? Do you realize with artificial intelligence, what I can do now, I can put an uh, uh, earpiece in and I can go to Germany and what I can do is get a, a program, and I can um, record my voice. The AI will take my voice, synthesize it, and then what I'll do is I'll speak in English. Could you please tell me where the sauerbraten is? You don't know what sauerbraten. Don't worry about it. Don't get hungry. Can you tell me where the restaurant is where they have sauerbraten? I say it in English. 
the artificial intelligence computer that I'm working with, chat, GPT, whatever it is, it will translate it to German, and it will use my voice in German to speak it out in German, real time. And they're saying in the next two years, you'll be a, almost everyone can go to Europe or wherever you have, have this thing in your, and you can have conversations with people in different languages. There's a little bit of a lull, obviously, because you have to speak into your thing, but they're going to hear your voice. So all these different languages that stop us from being in together is going away. In fact, artificial intelligence in many ways unifies the possibility of unity. Because what happens is these, um, these learning computers, they know how to learn what they do. They gather all the data from around the world, unified, and come together, and it's amazing what can happen. Now, people can be scared about this thing. Well, you know what? When the automobile was uh, invented, you want to uh, take a horse up a hill or just take a car. So it's, it's happening. But you can see that there's power in unity. Power in unity. In fact, I, I know I've used this before, but it's true. I, the good old Lucy. Remember Lucy from Peanuts? She said, Charlie Brown, these five fingers by themselves don't move much. But when they come together, it's a mighty force to contend with. God blesses brethren who dwell together in unity. And let me tell you right now, you and I as the church need to be unified. We've been getting divided over silly non-essential things that has caused all kinds of trouble. You and I need to unify under Jesus. Well, how on earth are we supposed to unify under Jesus? You see, the enemy's design is to break unity with you and God first. If you don't have unity with God, forget it. Then he tries to break unity with you and other people. Now, I'm going to ask you to do a little exercise to illustrate how simple yet profound this is. On the count of three, I'm going to ask everyone in this room, if you don't mind, even at home, you can type it in. I want to ask everyone to speak very loudly their name on the count of three. Okay? Your name on the count of three. Everyone, nice and loud, be obnoxious. You can be obnoxious in church now. Okay? One, two, three. Okay, let's do that again. You ready? One, two, three. Okay, didn't that sound great? That's what the world hears sometimes when it hears the church. But let's do something else. On the count of three, I want you to loudly say the word Jesus. Are you ready? One, two, three. Jesus. Again, one, two, three. Jesus. You want to have unity in your home? You need in your country. And listen, we're the answer to this. God has sent his church. And people often say to me, what do I do about marriage? Get in unity with Jesus. Get in unity with Jesus. Lord, you're my first, you're my utmost. I, I'm not trying to save my marriage. I want to get in unity with God first. And if she gets in unity with God and you get in unity with God, there's hope. But if you think you can just go to a counselor and do it all by yourself, good luck. We need Jesus. The only way that we're going to be a strong church is that you and I need to be unified with Jesus and unified with his purpose. It is the common denominator. So it's very important. Why is unity so important? I kind of share with you today because God commands the blessing. And Jesus had a main concern. I don't know if you've ever had this happen to me. It happened to me a number of years ago. I was, uh, I was on vacation in Florida we actually had, we're going to Disney World, and um, I had a situation where I had this little thing on my back, kind of bugged me. It was a tiny little thing, just a little thing like this. I mean, it was so small, it looked like a pen mark, maybe a couple pen marks. And it would itch, and sometimes it would bleed a little bit. And my wife goes, I don't look at it, it's nothing, it's nothing. She, I'm calling the doctor. So she called the doctor. So I go and get a biopsy. I'm like, oh, it's no big deal. I go on vacation to Florida. I get a phone call from. Uh, from Dr. I'm not going to mention his actual name, but it sounds like Millstone. When you get a call from Dr. Millstone, you better watch out. He says, oh, by the way, you have cancer. Huh? I say, what, Willis? What? You have melanoma cancer. I'm on vacation. Thanks a lot. So when I started thinking, I started reading about melanoma cancer. That's, not a, that's one of the most deadly disease ones you can get. 
I'm reading about it, and my life is flashing before my eyes. Oh, my God, what's going to happen to my kids? Do I have nice life insurance? Blah, 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 blah. I'm thinking all these things. My mind's going 1,000 miles per hour. Hello? Right? I'm thinking what's really important to me. By the way, I'm fine. They took it off. It's been a number of years. It, didn't, it was topical only. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you for much. Yeah. Thank God for Sandra. Husbands, listen to your wives. If I didn't go to the doctor, I don't know where I'd be. Seriously, if I didn't listen to my wife, he'd be in trouble today. So I listened to the Holy Spirit and I listened to my wife. Holy Spirit first. If the Holy Spirit disagrees with her, I don't listen. Okay. Of course, I am the Holy Spirit. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That's the problem, isn't it? But how do you know it's you or the Holy Spirit? Does it agree with the word? So there's great power in, in, in that whole process. And, and Jesus was coming to the end of his life, and he was thinking that he had to go to the cross. He knew that he'd be going. He'd rise again from the dead, and he would put the church in charge, and they would be enlarged, right? They're going to be in charge, and, and he's saying to the Father, he's thinking what's really important to him. When I got the news that I had cancer, I'm thinking, oh, my God, Literally, what am I going to do? If you get a car accident or something, you see a truck coming your way. This happened to me a couple of times. I'm like, oh boy, this is it. This is it, Lord. And my life flashes before my mind. Your mind does a quick flash drive, shows you your life real quick. And all you're thinking about right then is you wish you spent more time at the office. You wish you spent more time scrolling on the internet. You wish you put more Instagrams about this food that you had. No. What are you thinking about? You're thinking about people that mean the most to you. You're thinking about your family. If you're married, you think about your spouse or your children. You're thinking about what's the most important thing in your life. Everything else is not important. The most, the most important comes to the top. Well, guess what? Jesus was praying. He knew he was going to be persecuted, arrested, and killed on the cross, crucified. And what was on his mind is found in John chapter 17. He's praying to the Father out loud. His disciples hear it. And he's praying for something that's the most important. What does he say? Father, let them be one. In fact, he gives a new commandment. He tells his disciples, this is my commandment, that you love one another just as I've loved you. In John 17, he goes, he prays to the Father, Father, that they would what? Be one, be one of the same mind. Even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe you sent me. How is the world going to believe? They're going to see a unified church that loves Jesus. And the only way it can happen, everybody, we got to stop giving our opinions and start saying who Jesus is. Everything else must bow to Jesus. Everything else must bow to what he says, not what my preferences are. And this is so important. So Jesus, it's, it, why is it important for? Well, first of all, it's great power in unity, and Jesus' main concern is unity. Unity in Christ is unstoppable. It's unstoppable what God can do with a committed people. 120. We have more than that here right now. If we were full, full throttle saying, God, I want you and nothing else, everything else has to, has to take a bow before the God. And if we were filled with the Holy Spirit and we would run out with one solidarity, one purpose, we could change the world just from this room alone. Now, what would happen if millions of Christians would do that? So I want to encourage you that God wants to do that. Now, what do we do about that? Well, I'm so glad you asked because the Apostle Paul is dealing with the church that was extremely divided. This church was a mess. If you think the American church is a mess, we got it pretty good compared to the church in Corinth. They are messed up. And so we're going to look into relationships. We're going to look into sexuality. We're going to look into conflict resolution. We're going to find a lot through this book of the Bible because it speaks to us today on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to just go ahead and read it. Is it okay to read the Bible in church? Is, is that okay? We, we want to encourage you, by the way, to, to read the Bible at home. Okay, this is not just for the professional. Everyone should be reading the Bible. It's the most important thing you do next to eating and breathing and praying is reading the Bible. If all you do is, is pray, you'll blow up. If all you do is read the Bible, you'll dry up. But if you read and pray, you'll grow up. 
I'm telling you, it's the solidarity. It's the one of the most important things I do daily is I read the word and I pray and I journal. Without that, I'm, I'm not much use to anybody. I'm telling you right now, and it's not just me. It's millions of people would agree with me on that. So we're going to read about 1 Corinthians. We're going to read from chapter 1. And uh, this letter, he's writing to this church. He's hearing the stuff going on. You know, the Apostle Paul can't send a text message. You know, we can't get on a flight. He's got to send a letter the old-fashioned way. He earned it, right? He had to write a letter. And this is what he said. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God. He knew who he was, right? To be an apostle of Jesus, one that goes forward. And from our brother, Sothenes, which is Silas, by the way, I am writing to God's church, God's church. God's church is Cornerstone. It's not our church. What church? Is Cornerstone your church? No, it's the church I pastor. Thank you. If it's my church, then it's my problem. Uh, God, <laughs> this is yours, God. I, this is not mine. It, 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 Jesus says, you want to make it yours? <laughs> Good luck. No, no, thank you. No. He says, God's church in Corinth. This is a local area. There's house churches. It's a regional church that he's writing to. And they would go to place to place and read his letters. And, and by the way, let me just say something else about Corinth. Corinth was a bad place. If you were to say to someone, oh, yeah, Jack, yeah, he's a Corinthian. What would that mean? It means the guy is, he's like a mess. He is worldly. He's a party animal. You, you don't know what he's doing. Yeah, he's a Corinth. It's almost like what happens in Vegas is on someone's hard drive. Okay, we talked about that. And it'll be used against you if you run for office. Can I hear it? Oh, no. All right. But more importantly, Jesus sees what you're doing. I know we're laughing about it, but, it's, it's, but the thing of the matter is I'm writing to the church in Corinth. They were a mess, a Corinthian. And so if you're a Corinthian, it wasn't a good thing. So I'm writing to God's church in Corinth, to you who have been called by God to be his holy people. God wants us to be holy, set apart, set apart for him. He made you holy by how? By the means of Jesus Christ. Do you realize holiness is not trying to do everything correct? Holiness comes from Jesus Christ. You see, what brings us unity is Jesus Christ. What makes us one is Jesus Christ. The great leveling field is Jesus Christ. We're all equal before the cross, everybody. If I were to go outside tonight, tonight we go outside, it's a full moon, as I say, and I were to tell you, some of you are 15 years old, some of you are 95 years old, I say, okay, everybody, this is what we're going to do. I want you to jump onto the moon. Now, it's, it's ludicrous to go outside and think that I can jump my way to the moon. Maybe I can jump three inches. Maybe one of you can jump 10 inches or three feet. I don't know. But compared to the moon, what difference does it make? And compared to Jesus Christ, we are, pardon me to say this, we're, we're holy wrecks. We have nothing to offer God. The Bible says your righteousness is like filthy rags. I mean, we have nothing to give. And so if you think you're all of that, you're not. And when you understand what a wreck you are, if not by the vehicle of Jesus, if you go into Jesus like a rocket ship to take you to a new orbit, you can't do it on your own. So it, what it does, everybody, it kind of humbles us a little bit. Actually, a lot. God, if it wasn't for you, I could not stand. So what he said made you holy by, why? By the means of Jesus Christ. Now, I can respond to God, and that's important. We should celebrate people responding to God. But you, you're not all that without God. He goes on to say, just as he did for all the people everywhere who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Their Lord and ours. May God our what? Our Father, which is amazing. He uses the word Abba, which means close relationship. And the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Grace is unmerited favor. Who wants to have unmerited favor? I want that. Who wants peace? Yeah, I, yeah, I want peace. God gives peace that the world can't take away. See, I, he, goes, he goes on to say, I always thank God for you for the, for the gracious gifts he's given to you that you belong to Jesus Christ. Through him, God has enriched your church in every way. With all of your eloquent words and all your knowledge, this confirms what I told you about Christ is true. 
Now you have spiritual gift. You need as you eagerly wait for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will keep you strong. We're waiting for Christ to come back. Either I'll go to him or come to us. Who's going to keep you strong? He's going to keep you strong. Remember we talked a couple, last week, we said we're not called to live for God. We're called to what? Live with God. The only way I can be strong is with Christ. I cannot be strong on my own. I may have good disciplines. I may work it hard, but without Christ, I'm nothing. He will keep you strong. How? By working in partnership with him. And to that end, that you will be free from all blame. Remember, everybody, you go chasing all your sins. Good luck. Chase Jesus, and he'll show you what you need to deal with at that moment and that time. He'll give you grace. He'll simplify your life. Your life won't be so complicated. Your life will be simple, profound, and free. You'll be free from all blame on the day when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. God will do this, for he is faithful to do what he says. And he's invited you into what? Partnership, partnership. He doesn't want you to live for him. He wants you to live with him. Partner means I'm a partner with this person. Jesus says, come to me, all who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I'll give you rest. Learn from me. Take my yoke upon you. Jesus wants to kneel down with you and to take the yoke, and together you will pull with Jesus. Pull with him and the body of Christ. I appeal to you, dear... Now he's getting... Now we talked about who they are as a church, right? This is all good stuff. Now we're starting to get into business. I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ to live in harmony with each other. What does it mean to be in harmony? Not e-harmony. What does it mean to be in harmony? Harmony means that you're singing or you're, you're, the notes are working together. Now, some of you have seen this and... You probably saw this illustration before, but if you've ever been to an orchestra and they're, they're warming up their instruments, you have the clarinets and trombones and everything else and playing with things, and it's, it's chaos, kind of like what it was when I asked you to give your name. All of a sudden, the conductor, he or she goes like this. Everyone's quiet, right? Now, in an orchestra, you have the sheet music in front of you, but you don't begin the sheet music until the conductor. The conductor's almost like Jesus and the scriptures are like the music. And he'll get the beat. Stop. You go louder, you go softer, right? And a beautiful piece of music, you can have different conductors, and the, the, the piece of music will sound different based upon the conductor. So it isn't just having the sheet music. It's playing with other people, learning to prefer another part more than you. Sometimes the worst, the worst bands you ever hear, and, and John can tell you this, sometimes you have worship teams. We had a situation a number of years ago. We had a person that played the flute, and they thought that every single song had to have the flute at all times, no matter what. We're trying to, I mean, no matter what. Well, that's my anointing. Don't take away my anointing. Well, you can find your anointing someplace else because you're annoying, all right? She wouldn't stop playing the flute. Not in this church, by the way. Can I hear an Amen. I would never do that to anyone here. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but live in harmony. And so what it means is, is it means I'm going to listen to the music. I'm going to play to the music. And, and there's a synergy that's going on. You know, when you get it together with a couple of musicians, I have found when I have played with really good musicians, my playing goes to another level. Because the, the synergy of the music helps me to play better. And so when we are playing together, we have more power than we do by ourselves. And when we listen to Jesus, who's the author of the music, by the way, that you're reading before, he's the author and the completer. And not only is he the author and the completer, but he's conducting us, giving us the rhythm and the time to know when to stop. My friends, this is what it's called to do. We're to live in harmony with each other. And so I remember being in an orchestra, and that's my part, and I'm, I'm, I'm playing real loud. Shh, no, no, I want, you to bring, I want you to bring it down. You're too loud with the trombone. Obviously, you play trombone. Play quieter. And so I had to listen to the conductor. And this is what happens. Let there be no, what? Division. Division. No division in the church. Rather be of what? One mind. How's that supposed to happen? Well, hang on. United into one thought and purpose. For some members of Chloe's household have told me about your quarrels, my dear brothers and sisters. Notice he's calling them brothers and sisters. 
Some of you are saying, I'm a follower of Paul. Now, Paul was the founder of the church there. The, Paul would speak primarily. Often he was called the apostle to the Gentiles, non-Jewish church. People, I'm the apostle Paul. And then all of a sudden, someone else would say, I follow Apollos. Apollos was a Greco-Roman, and he probably had more education. And he, Oh, wow, I really, really deep teaching. His, his teaching is so deep and profound, and it's so eloquent. And Apostle Paul, you know, he's just the, oh, the, we like Apollos. Others say, I follow Peter, who probably had more of a, a Jewish bent on his teaching. And then, of course, we all know these people, right? Who do you follow? <clears throat> I follow Christ. You ever find those people that say that? And these same people go like this. Oh, the Lord told me yesterday to do this. Oh, really? Oh, okay. And then two weeks later, I, I thought the Lord told you to do that. Oh, he did, but um, mm, okay, be careful, right? I have a corner on the market. The Apostle Paul said, forget about these guys. Forget about me. It's very clear. The Apostle Paul, one of the most important scriptures in Scripture, he says this. If anyone is to preach a different gospel than you've received from us, even if I, the Apostle Paul said, if I give you a different gospel or an angel from heaven, let them be accursed. So there's a standard there, right? So I only, has Christ been divided into factions? Uh, yes, and fortunately it has, hasn't it? Yeah. Was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were any of you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not. You guys are crazy. That's what he's basically saying. I thank God I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. If you ever have, any, ever have a child, call him Crispus. <laughs> for now, no one can say they were baptized by my name. He's just kind of saying, this is ridiculous. If I baptize you, you'd say, well, I'm by Paul. Oh, yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. They're talking about people they know. But I don't remember baptizing anyone else. For Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news. So he would preach the good news, and other people would baptize. Then check this out. And not with clever speech. There are people that would be traveling evangelists, and they would be really eloquent. They'd be funny. They'd be like Christian celebrities. I enjoy this pastor so much. I love this church. This church is the church. This is the best pastor ever. We love this pastor. We love this teacher. We love this movement. And they make everything about, we believe it should be this way. And I like this. Our preferences become God's. And, you know, again, it's easy for me to say this because I'm not a celebrity. But when, when, when you get to the point where your platform is so large and so big, you become a Christian celebrity. We have to reject the celebrity culture where it's all about the man or woman of God. I personally don't like, I'm just be honest with you, this is my personal view. Maybe I'm stepping out of line, but I'll, I'll go ahead and do it. But if, 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 if there's a picture of Cornerstone Church, and here's me. Come to Cornerstone. I'm sitting there all oiled up. You know what I'm talking about, everybody. I mean, I got muscles ripping out of me. I'm like, hey, everybody. Before I get on the stage, I'm doing sets of bench press, and I come out. Well, oh, he's so, you know, seriously, everybody, is it about that, really? Oh, the pastor's, the pastor's hot. I've heard that one. No, not here. My wife said that, okay? <laughs> to everyone else, I'm not, but to her, I'm hot. But it's not about the clever speech. Oh, he's so funny. He makes me laugh. There's nothing wrong with enjoying someone that preaches the gospel, but don't let the mailman become the message. you got to read the message of God. My job really is to help you to get hungry for God so you go home and you make your own meals, that you read the Bible yourself, and that this on Sunday is gravy. This is like extra this is not your own meal during the week and in podcasts and everyone else. Focus on the absolute. How do we do it? We have to focus on the absolutes. How do we have unity? We need to focus on the absolutes. What are the absolutes? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Here's some absolutes that we can focus on, everybody. The absolutes is Jesus is the only way to salvation. There's no way to God without Jesus. Jesus says, I am the only way. I'm the only truth. I'm the only life. Not Buddhism. Not Mormonism. No other religion in the world. Jesus is the only one. That's so narrow. Yeah, narrow is the path that leads to salvation. Broad is the road that leads to hell. Well, what about people that never heard about God? I don't know what's going to happen except for the fact they're going to have to go through Jesus. And the only assurance of salvation is through Jesus Christ. So that's all, everything. Christ is the only way. That's an absolute. 
Jesus is the one way. And the man on the cross who was dying, the criminal next to Jesus, he said, remember me today in salvation. He didn't understand the, the four spiritual laws. He didn't understand anything at that point. He accepted Jesus. You follow that? Here's some absolutes. God made male and female and called it what? Good. Didn't say we have to prove it. No, it's good. And without God, we're nothing. So that's an absolute right there. Here's another one. I like what this says here. Unity, this is very important. Unity without the gospel is worthless unity. It is the very unity of hell. There are churches out there flying all kinds of flags, and they've denied the gospel. Flying flags of secularism. Flying flags of whatever. It's not about different flags. It's about Jesus Christ. He's the utmost, everybody. So the gospel is Jesus. We have to understand that. So what do we do? Well, I'm so glad you asked because we have essentials. And here's some other things we can look at right here. You have essentials. You have absolutes. Okay, these are very important, of heaven and hell. These are also very important because if you don't believe the Bible is the final authority, the Apostle Paul said this gospel, anyone preaches a different gospel, and much of the writings were already there, then let them be accursed. So our objective is we believe, theologically speaking, the Bible is without error theologically, and we believe that's our final authority. It doesn't mean that's a buffet line, and I like this, but I don't like that. It's not that. Our Bible is our final authority and there's people out there twisting the bible for their own liking no they're not christians they're the unity of hell but if you believe in god and you also believe in the infallibility of scripture and then here's some points that we can agree or disagree with baptism in the holy spirit is it important absolutely it's important some people think you have it i'm gonna get into that right now baptism methods should i be baptized as a baby or as an adult okay we have our convictions it's important, but it's not essential. All right? Then we have another one here. We have another one here. We have theology and views. You have, for example, are you pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, or no-trib? I don't have time to get into that, but it's different theology. Should women be in ministry or not? We're not going to divide over those types of things. Are they important to I realize? Absolutely. But are we going to fight over things like that outside the church walls? No. No, it's okay for a church to have its standards. But we're not supposed to fight against each other. Here's another one. Preferences and opinions. Well, I believe you should only have the King James Version. King James Version, pardon is basically a, a, a translation of the Greek, Hebrew, and the Aramaic back in the 1600s. So there's some other fine translations as well. And so are we going to divide over that? Or I think there should be no instruments in church. There are people that believe that. Nowhere in the New Testament were there any instruments. Therefore, we should not have any instruments in church. You know, the Bible says a loud gong. A light. The Bible talks about making a joyful noise with cymbals and all kinds of things. I feel that a church service should go on for three hours. Can I hear, oh, no. In fact, I, if I had church my way, we'd have a, a three hours of worship. We'd have a seven-hour sermon. We'd have roasted pig afterwards and barbecue and cornbread. Can I hear an amen? Wow, I have a pretty popular church if I do that. So we can't allow, guys, we need to focus on the absolutes. And I, I, the Bible talks about, I, like, I love what... Um, Focus on the absolutes. Okay? Focus on the absolutes. Let's speak the same thing. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there are no, what? Divisions among you, but that you are united in the same mind, same judgment with all humility. And also it says this in Ephesians, with all humility and what? Some of you are not very gentle on social media. Gentleness with what? Patience. You don't need patience unless people are irritating. Right? I don't need patience if you're not irritating or I'm not irritating. Bearing with one another in love, eager to what? Maintain. You don't have to make unity. You have to maintain it. When you get married, you're married. What's your job after? To maintain your marriage, to make it strong. When we give our life to Christ, we're unified. Our job is to maintain what God has given us by his name. 
That's how we do it. You see, unity is a matter of the will. Division is a matter of the won't. Unity is a matter of the will, and this is what we need to do. We need to put together these things. Listen, let's, let's kind of tie this up right now. We need to focus on the absolutes. Let's seek to say the same thing. Let's seek to understand both sides of the story. The Apostle Paul says, I'm all things to all people that I may win some. Listen before you speak, right? Slow, quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. And the Bible is very clear about this. It says, says, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of the low position. Yeah, but I'm, I'm learned. I have a theology degree. So what? Go ahead and jump on the moon. You can't do it. Do not be conceited. I love what Nicky Gumbel said. He said this. When we build on a foundation of unity, love, and forgiveness, we can weather any storm together as the body of Christ. I want to encourage you as we see the day get darker, do not forsake the gathering together as some have made the habit, but join together, not just here, but in your other groups as well, that you grow strong together and watch what God can do with a unified church that Christ is in the center. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you're an amazing God. We thank you that you love us, that you died for us, Father. We thank you, Father God. It's just beautiful, Lord. We're so tired of the world's way. The world's way is always trying to outdo the other person. But Jesus, you outdid us all by a margin we could never do unless you take us there through surrender.